Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mrs. Juliana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, welcome to week two of the Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program, Intellectual Property um, for, to be specific. So my name is Aya Oyuwadi Rebecca and I'll be anchoring today's session. Please, uh, before we proceed to the session proper, I'll be taking some announcements. So um, registration for the fourth quarter of the Gypsy Mentorship Program, which is coming on after this, the last quarter of the year is currently ongoing. You can see it on your, on your screen, the flyer is on your screen. So registration is ongoing if you're interested in participating in this mentorship program again, or you have friends who are interested in any of the areas, intellectual property, artificial intelligence and technology, energy, fintech, healthcare and law and patent drafting, please share this information with them before the registration closes. And also um, there is the private mentorship opportunity going on. You can have a 30 minutes private, private mentorship um, opportunity with any of our mentors, with Mrs. Juliana herself or any of the mentors, if you are interested please contact the number on the flyer or contact Mrs. Juliana directly if you can. So I'd encourage us to take this opportunity seriously. Beyond the benefits of the group mentorship, a one-on-one -on -one mentorship would also go a very long way. Now, as we um, commence presentation and the rest of these sessions, we're encouraged to please turn on our cameras. It is a video meeting. It will be better if all our videos are on, we can interact better and we can see one another. As we all know, the meeting is being live streamed. So please, when you're presenting, let your presentations be as seamless as possible and make sure that you are in a tidy and quiet environment if you are putting on your microphone. Also for the mentees who have not done this, please we're encouraged to edit the name your username on Zoom should be your full names because attendance is being taken. So we can identify each and every one of you for the purpose of attendance. Please edit your Zoom user name. Then lastly, um, Gypsy is putting together an end of year party for past and present mentees of the program. It's coming up on the 10th of December Yes, it's a Saturday, 10th of December. The flyer is also up. You can look at it. It's holding in, Abuj in Abuja. Yes, this first, the first event is holding in Abuja. The registration link is up. I think you can get the registration link on the group chat, on your um, group chat. You can get it on the social media platforms. Please register as an opportunity to meet everyone in person and to meet some of the mentors in person too. So now I'll be introducing our mentors for today. Mentors that will be joining us for today's session. Okay, our first mentor for today is Mr. Michael Dugary. Now I'll be reading out his profile. Michael Dugary is a partner in the commercial law firm of Austin Peters and Co, where he focuses his practice on entertainment, technology, corporate, intellectual property, and general business transactions. He is also a public speaker and facilitator at events that provide capacity building for artists, writers, directors, and producers in the media and entertainment industries. Michael is the author of the book, Entertainment Law in Nigeria, Emerging Trends, Sources, Practice, and Precedents. So we are glad to have you with us, Michael Dugary, and we look forward to an insightful session with you. Our second mentor, 
Our second mentor for today is Liz Len Lenjo. Please pardon the pronunciation of the name. Liz Lenjo is an advocate um, of the High Court of Kenya, a commissioner for Oaths and Notary Public. Liz Lenjo is the founder and managing consultant of My IP Legal Studio. She specializes in intellectual property, entertainment, media and fashion law. She is an immediate former member of the Copyright Tribunal, the tribunal established under section 48 of the Copyright Act, Cap 132. She serves in the Kenya Fashion Council as the head of intellectual property and policy in the legal committee. She is an adjunct faculty member of the Strathmore University Law School, where she teaches sports law, media and entertainment law as well as business law. Liz is also a tutor. Liz is also a tutor with copyrights by Harvard X Kenya. This is run by the Gordon Art Center. Liz holds a master of laws in intellectual property from the University of Turin, Italy and World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO a Bachelor of Law from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa and postgraduate, a di Diploma Kenya School of Law. She also holds a certificate in Fashion Law from Fashion Law Institute, Fordham University Law School, New York. She also has professional certificates in IP management, mediation and arbitration from WIPO Academy and Copyright X from Harvard X. Liz is also a published writer and scholar. Her LLM research paper has been published by the renowned Market International Property Law Review 2018, titled Inspiration versus Exploitation, Traditional Cultural Expressions at the Helm of the Fashion Industry. The paper is available online on Westlaw and Nexus, as well as the Marquee IP Review Online. Their web, the Marquee IP Review Online website. Um, she has also written and been quoted in several local newspapers, including the Sunday Nation, the Standard, the Star, Up Magazine, which is now defunct, Copyright News, among others, as well as international news platforms. Liz is a blogger on www.lizlenger.com on IP and entertainment law matters, focusing on non-legal minds to understand basic issues in these areas of law. She is also the chapter leader of Creative Commons Kenya and the head of the culture of culture and entertainment platform. Liz has been recognized for her efforts in the legal field and is the recipient of the prestigious nomination in Kenya Business Daily Top 40 Under 40 Women 2018. Welcome, Ms. Liz Lenjo. We are glad to have you on today's session of the Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program. So now we're moving on to the group presentations. Um, today we have four groups presenting, group one to group four. We make it a presentation today, and each group has a total of eight minutes to make their presentation. So, group one to four, you each have eight minutes to make your presentation. Please, you are making use of your slides and make sure your presentation is straight to the point, as detailed as possible, but straight to the point. So, we do not take too much of other group's time. So, group one, you are starting your presentation. Group one, are you ready for your presentation? Group one, are we ready for your presentation? Okay, you have- Yes, yeah, good on everyone. You may start now. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Favor Abalaji. I'm presenting a behalf of group one on the topic intellectual property protection for creatives, specifically the literary works, visual arts, and dance creatives. By way of introduction, 
I'll start by saying that intellectual property protection is the bedrock of creativity. It enables creatives to earn recognition of financial benefits from what they invent or create. Now, creatives are faced with IP-related issues on a daily basis. And generally, the fundamental intellectual property protection available for creatives are copyrights and related rights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets and industrial designs. However, for the purpose of this presentation and because of our spe specific focus on literary works, visual arts and dance creatives, we limit our focus to copyright as it is the intellectual property protection available or applicable to literary works, dance and visual arts creatives. Now, what is copyright? Copyright under the Nigerian Copyright Act is a legal protection granted to creators or originators of creative works, whether literary, music, musical, artistic, or cinematographic works, or an adaptation of any of these eligible works. Copyright is a form of intellectual property. It is the right granted to the author or originator of a certain literary or artistic production, whereby the creator is invested for a limited period with the sole and exclusive privilege of multiplying copies of the literary or artistic works and publishing or selling them. Now, moving to the first category we're talking about today, which is literary works. What are literary works? Literary works are works other than audiovisual works expressed in words, numbers, or any other verbal or numerical symbols or indica, regardless of the nature of the material objects, such as books, periodicals, manuscripts, journals, articles, and so on. And copyright in literary, musical, or artistic works, rather than photographs, lasts for 70 years during the lifetime of the creator and last for the lifetime of the creator and for 70 years after the death of the creator. Now, how does intellectual property protection benefit literary works creatives? The first benefit it has to literary works creatives is it reduces risk of infringement. Intellectual property protection, mainly copyright protection, reduces the risk of infringement with ease of access to the internet these days. Plagiarism, piracy, and all sorts are rampant, and having intellectual property protection for your literary work will reduce the risk of infringement as no one can reproduce, copy, uh, manipulate, alter your work without um, authorization. And if this occurs, an action can be brought against them for infringement. Also, Intellectual property protection on your work shows the originality of the work, mainly copyright as one of the provisions or one of the one of the main conditions for a work to be eligible for copyright protection is that it must be original. It shows the originality of the work to prospective clients and it's gonna expose the creatives to more opportunities. Another Another benefit it offers to literary works creative is that is the duration of protection. Now, as I stated earlier, intellectual property copyright protection gives the literary works creative a protection for the his whole lifetime and even 70 years after this. So this could be an incentive for innovation. Now, an example of a literary works creative that, that copyrighted their work and gained revenue from this. We have the Harry Potter franchise. In 2016, the total value of the Harry Potter franchise was estimated at $25 billion, making Harry Potter one of the highest grossing media franchises of all time. Now, on an example, on example of a literary work that was not copyrighted and lost revenue because of this, we have the case of Paul Allen Ochi versus Nigerian Beris PLC. In this case, the Leonard trial judge concluded that because the plaintiff failed to exhibit his evidence of registration of copyright, he did not have or he has not shown local standards to bring an action for copyright infringement. And this led to the loss of revenue from the Amsterdam Water Factor, an Amsterdam Water Guide on how to be the best you can be, which was a work created by the plaintiff and he lost revenue by not copywriting his work. Now to the next category of creatives, we have visual arts. Visual arts are deemed to be creations of visual works such as drawings, paintings, photographs, sculptures, or printmaking. The discipline includes fine arts as well as applied or decorative arts and crafts. In some contexts, it has been extended to include art created by digital media. Now, copyright protects original pieces of visual works from being copied without permission. This is a, a, a way by which copyright protection benefits visual, visual arts creatives. It protects their work from infringement. It's, their work cannot be copied, reproduced in any form without um, authorization by the original owner of the work. And the work must be the result of a person's skill, effort, and judgment. It cannot be something that already exists. So the protection is given when the work is original in a way. So 
we have examples of of persons or a person that gained revenue from a visual arts creative that gained revenue from protecting his copyright. In the case of Rogers versus Coons, Rogers shot a photograph of a couple holding a line of puppies in a row and sold it for use in greeting cards and similar products. Internationally renowned artist Jeff Coons, in the process of creating an exhibit on the banality of everyday items, ran across this photograph and used it to create a set of statues based on the image. Now, Rogers took the matter to court and an action for infringement to court and was awarded damages by the court because he protected his work. Now, an example of a person who lost revenue from not protecting his, his work, a, a visual art creative, in the case of Mark Antonio Raimondi versus Albert Dura, our artist Albert Dura discovered in the early 1500s that a fellow engraver by the name of Mark Antonio was copying one of his famous works. So he took the issue to the court of Venice and the court ruled that Raimondi could continue making copies as there was no sufficient proof that that work was uh, or belonged to Albert because it did not protect this work, did not copyright this work. Now we're moving to the last group of creatives, which is dance. A dance is considered to be a creative work and can be copyrighted if it's a coherent whole and not just an individual dance. According to section 51 sub 1b of the Nigerian Copyright Act, choreography work is defined as a composition of movements for dancing or any other pattern succession of gestures mostly created to accompany music. Section 26 of Nigerian Copyright Act listed the rights of the performer to include the right to control his performance, the reproduction or adaptation of the performance. This, this section defines performance as a dramatic performance, including dance or mime. So intellectual property protection, copyright protection gives a dance uh, creative exclusive rights to his work. Um, no, no one can reproduce or reuse that work without the, perform or without the um, authorization of the creator. Now, section 23 gives the performer, as I said, exclusive rights to his work. The performers of dance can hold the copyright to a dance from the end of the year in which the performance was made of up to 50 years. It is sad, however, to know that several dancers are unaware of how to gain intellectual property protection for their choreography and how to prevent loss of revenue. Recently, however, awareness has been raised and several dancers have protected their famous dances and choreography. An example is Fallout Catland, who choreographed Doja Cat's CISO performance of the 2020 Billboard Music Awards. Now, an example of a person who gained revenue from protecting his, a dance creative would gain revenue from protecting his copyright or his work. Jacqueline Knight is a renowned dancer and choreographer who created dance moves for Beyonce's hit single, Single Ladies. He secured the copyright for the protection for the choreography in 2020 and has since then collaborated with the Switzerland based company Logitech to help more creators secure their copyrights for the choreography of popular dance trends. Now, an example of a person who lost revenue, a dance creative. A dancer who lost revenue from not protecting his work. We have Nigerian artist Zlatan who created a dance, a set of dance steps popularly known as Zanku Legwork. So this choreography has since then gone viral and has, and has been used on many social media platforms. And he has not been able to generate income from this choreography because he did not copyright it. Now we'll be moving on to importance of intellectual property for create intellectual property protection for creatives generally. Rufan, now, please, please wrap it up. You have okay. All right. Now, creatives dedicate a substantial amount of time and energy in enhancing their output. It is therefore only fair that they should be accorded protection in some way to help them generate and enhance economic value for their work. And some of the benefits of industrial property protection to creatives are reduced risk of infringement, strengthening competition, ad adequate incentive for innovation, increased commercial value, originality, it shows the originality of the work to prospective clients and extended market reach. Now, by way of conclusion, it is necessary for creatives to protect all their innovations, to prevent infringement. Literary works, visual arts, and dance are also protected by intellectual property, and every owner should endeavor to register in obedience to relevant laws as it is a valuable asset to our world. Failure to protect one's innovation puts a person at risk of losing revenue. Safeguarding and registering one's intellectual property is a smart move as it preserves the originality of the work, giving room for duplicity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rupa, for your presentation. So, Group Two, please proceed with your presentation. You have eight minutes. Please be brief. Round up within your eight minutes window. Group Two, are you ready? Group 
Group two, are you ready yes, for your presentation? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, please share screen. Thank you. Can we proceed. Are you about to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah and I'm Toy from Group 2. Um, I'll be discussing the protection. Hello, could you get, can you get me? Yes, yes can we hear. can hear you. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll be discussing the protection of uh, film creatives, music creatives, and uh, software uh, program creatives. Uh, to begin with, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by looking at the protection of film creatives. So filmmaking is a complex collaborative uh, endeavor, uh, which includes but not limited to uh, creating of scripts and uh, a script, a script playing and produce, uh, pro producing of both music and act, uh, acting performances. And therefore, uh, in the process of filmmaking process, there's a large number of people that are involved, uh, which starts from create, uh, creators, photographers, and actors themselves. So in order for them, for their right, for their creations to be protected, there is need for, <clears throat> for all of them to have an assigned document, which will help them claim ownership of uh, and license of the distribution that they do. So the type of protections that uh, exist in, uh, in filmmaking include um, the copyrights, uh, trademarks, and patents. With the copyright, it's basically protecting the, the scripts that are made by the filmmakers, uh, which is done by obtaining protection from the written scripts. And in addition, it's used to uh, as a mode of protecting both the characters and the scripts that are written. Uh, when it comes to trademarks, um, the production companies use trademarks to as as a way of creating a distinctive identity, which stand out in, in crowded marketplaces. Um, these are examples of um, titles of movies like uh, Star Wars and key characters like James Bond. Uh, these movies um, are protected under the the trade the trademark as a way of um, holding back and ensuring that there's 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 benefit from the creators of these movies. Uh, the other co component we have of protection under the film um, uh, making is uh, the patents. So the innovation, the, the innovative hardwares um, that are used as tools in um, in filmmaking are, are protected uh, in order to create an extraordinary experience for movies. Things like um, the three D experiences and the animation software that are used or the green screens. These are um, modes in which uh, they can be protected. Uh, we'll, we have a case uh, uh, study importance on how the protections are used to upon uh, on how the importance of um, rights registration when they are when they are protected is an example of um, the 2020 uh, the 2011 Sundance Festival which brought about various um, act, uh, film actors and producers who made. Um, quite a lot of money from a collection of movies which were about 120 films and were selected for, for further distribution and, um, um, and direction by, by various actors. This was a mode that brought about uh, monies in the filming industry, which, which went to about uh, 7 million um, just from the filmmaking industry. So this is an example of how uh, protection of uh, these rights can be can can be enhanced. We have an example of um, a, a film that could is likely to lose a lot of money due to its failure to to have its rights um, registered. An example is that of a Paramount a copyright lawsuit in the movie uh, in the Top Gun movie, where um, um, Paramount has failed to reacquire the uh, the required um, right to to copyright to copyright a story. Uh, before they could completely release the, the latest um, uh, Top Gun movie, which is currently showing in movies. Um, and according to experts in the film industry, if the lawsuit moves forward, it could mean that um, the Paramount uh, is likely to distribute the Top Gun 
but with the ability with the failure for them to give back to uh, to give back the original script to the owners they are they're likely to acquire a lot of um, damages and um, uh, copyright infringement which is likely to to be a great loss on the part of uh, paramount this this is this is something that came about because of their failure to obtain right um, the the rights to to produce the, the movie from the rightful owners. The next concept we are looking at is a protection for music creatives. So when we talk about protection of um, uh, music creatives, we're basically talking about um, ensuring the artists um, being the creators of the, uh, the being the creators of the music um, in the industry, there is need for them to have uh, compensation from the works that they are done uh, through the protection rights, um, which, which is through a taking of legal actions on any person that um, infringes on their works. So these are, these protections mostly exist in two categories, uh, which are uh, the first one is the right to protect um, the existing uh, music works, which could be the composition of the music, the, the music notes, the chords, the rhythms, and uh, the harmonies. The second right could be the right relating to the sounds the masterpieces, the recordings, and any compositions that come about due uh, to the music that, that they produce. So the different types of uh, rights that exist in the music creation, uh, copyrights and trademarks. When we talk about trademarks, we are basically talking about uh, trademarks. Uh, um, so when we talk about copyright in under music rights, we're basically talking about the, uh, the creators receiving income from the recordings that they do, and the, the publishing rights uh, to the musical compositions, which allow creatives to have royalties, uh, not only for, for public, but also for, for television and um, radio channels uh, communications. Then when you talk about uh, trade, trademarks, we're basically talking about how uh, these identities that are created through trademarks by, um, by owners, an example could be uh, the names of actors and musicians who use their names as trademarks um, can use their names uh, to, earn, to earn a living and ensure that their names are not used for distribute, uh, for distribute, uh, distribute or um, any other means in which they, they don't intend to. Um, an example of um, a case where a musician, a musician could have lost out on, um, could have won a case uh, in relation to a music copyright would be the case of Marvin Gray who composed and recorded a song uh, called, You Gotta To Give It Up. In 2013, um, Robin Thicke and three others um, composed the song, uh, composed and uh, uh, produced a song called Blurred Lines. Uh, Blurred Lines. In that song, uh, there was a line that sounded most like, um, the one that was done by uh, Marvin Gray, uh, Marvin Gay in 1976. So upon 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 Marvin Gray noticing that, uh, he sued the three for for copyright of the song, and um, the Marvin Gray estate has not only been awarded uh, damages uh, due to infringement, but they they are entitled to ongoing 50% royalties of the the publishing revenues that are going to come out from <clears throat> the songs that have been done by the song that has been done by uh, Robin Thicke with the others with the three others. Another case is the case of uh, Val versus a Rolling Stone, where the where originally the Val had round up to uh, where please the round. sorry. Please, we need to round up your presentation. Your time is up. Okay. Um, okay. Let me go to the last. Okay, sorry. The last part uh, we are looking at is the protection of software and software programs. Um, this is um, basically where um, uh, software programs uh, like compu uh, for computers are used as a mode of protection. Um, this is because uh, for a computer to function, they're programmed in a way that a person needs to set instructions of a language in, to, to comprehend the programs. And therefore, as uh, IP rights, 
uh, include legal protection of both the computer its programs and the developer itself. Uh, this can either be where, this can be in two ways. Uh, this can be, the protection can be in three ways, which is uh, through a trade, uh, trade secrets, uh, trademarks and patents. With uh, it, with trademarks, it's basically protecting the invasion uh, the invasion of of the product from it being stolen by other people. With trademarks, we are looking at the titles, the brands, and the names uh, the names or or logs in which the the set programs exist. With patents, we are basically looking at um, ensuring that the programs are not uh, paralyzed or imitated from the original works. Uh, so in summary, we have um, we have artists and creators. In summary, we have artists and creators who who take a lot of time to ensure that um, they do they do their very best in producing uh, <clears throat> uh, new works, new innovations, and new products on the market. It is therefore important for them to. Uh, to ensure that their products are protected and that they don't they do not lose out on on any financial gains that they could in a in a in a situation in a situation uh, that um, in if, if a situation arose that would require them to have their products um, to have their their, their product protected it, it it would be important that they have them protected under intellectual property rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lutu, for your presentation. And um, please, before we proceed to the next group, I'll just like to say to the mentors, please will be taking your comments and your feedback after all the groups have made their presentations. So after group four concludes with their presentation, we'll be taking your comments and feedback on all four presentations. Thank you very much. So group three, group three, please. Are you ready for your presentation? Yeah. Please share your screen and you have eight minutes. The time is starting in 30 seconds, group three. If group three is not ready, is group four ready? Hello. Okay. Good. Hello. Hello, everyone. All right. We um, can my hear you. My name is Adili Kiyadi Dolapo. I'll be presenting on behalf of group three. Our presentation is on intellectual property protection for creative in the fashion industry, broadcast and comedy industry. Nigeria, in Nigeria, the creative industry is made up of music, dance, film, theater, literature, fashion, television, radio, advertising, information techno technology subsectors. In a recent study in Jobama, research revealed that a creative industry is the creative industry in Nigeria is the second target employer and bound to produce about 2.7 million jobs by 2025. Entrepreneurs in these different subsectors are referred to as creatives. Now, why is IP protection important for creatives? Creatives in the fashion industry, broadcast and comedy subsectors dedicate their time and resources to increase their outputs. IP protection is important for creatives so that the creatives can ex extend their market reach by licensing or assigning their IP rights for others at a fee. IP protection is also important so as to strengthen competition so creatives can stop their works from being reproduced by competitors, thereby improving their competitive edge. Facts about the fashion industry. Fashion law applies to apparels, footwear, footwears, and even accessories. This emerging field practice covers such as copyrights, trademarks, service marks, utility patents, design patents, counterfeits, trade, trade secrets, licensing agreements, advertising and publicity, every stage of the fashion business. It is believed that globally, the fashion industry generates more than two trillion annually. The emerging trends of intellectual property protection in fashion law. Social media has helped foster co-branding, endorsement opportunities between fashion brands and social media personalities, which has the benefits of allowing all parties to draw from larger public audience. The industry has recently seen the increasing use of design patents and trademark to protect their IP rights. This type of IP vehicles protects the look of a particular product or certain new design elements of such a product. An example of design patents might be an ornament sculptural element 
for example, an intricate bow fixed to a shoe, a distinctive color scheme that appears on a particular brand products and the brand. There are cases where, whereby parties have gained revenue and also lost revenue. The case of Star Athletic LLC versus Varsity Branch Incorporated centered on whether certain creative elements of the design of a cheerleader's uniform, such as the stripes of a chevron, could be protected under the US copy law. copyright law. The Supreme Law clarified that in general terms, certain creative elements, whether two-dimensional or three-dimensional of the garments, may be protected by copyright law. However, the Supreme Court refused to speak on the protectability of the level of creativity in use in a specific uniform in question. Is there legal framework for IP protection for creatives in the fashion industry in Nigeria? It is obvious that the huge growth in Nigerian fashion industry incites the need for the law to provide valuable guides on the issues that designers face. However, Nigeria has no all embracing and specified legal framework governing the fashion industry. Therefore, a specific law that protects fashion brands does not exist. IP lawyers have just resorted to general protection provided for under the existing IP framework in Nigeria. Existing IP legal framework for the protection of creative in fashion industries are Copyright Act, the Patent and Design Act, the Trademark Act. Under the Copyright Act, work of the, uh, work of the designers are artistic create. create creations and can be protected under the Copyright Act. Although the design must not be intended to be used as a model or pattern to be multiplied by any industrial process. Another protection under the Patents and Design Act, a combination of lines and colors or a dimensional form with or without colors is recognized as an industrial design. One limitation to this design, however, is that it must not be used in a public domain. Therefore, there is no urgent laws that offer adequate protection for fashion brands and their waves in Nigeria. What is broadcasting industry about? Broadcasting involves a systematic dissemination of contents for a reception of a vast audience who possesses receiving medium. Under the general principle of National Broadcasting Code 2016, sixth edition, as amended 2020, broadcasting is described as a creative medium, professionalism, choice, and innovation to serve the interest of the public. The, the broadcasting industry in Nigeria has developed in recent times. The access to the latest technology and information has increased rapidly in the internet age, sparking the creativity among the public who are now generating and sharing original works in significant volumes. This then presents the broadcasting industry with, with numerous challenges. Related rights or neighboring rights. This is the type of intellectual property protection associated with copyright works. For creative works to be consumed by the public, they are, they are key players who play active roles in bringing the creative works to the public. The main essence of related rights is to protect the legal interests of certain persons or organizations who contributes to making works available to the public or those who have technical or organization skills to work. An example of this class of persons are the broadcasters. Since broadcasters put in reasonable investments and efforts in putting work together and broadcasting the famous program, it would be justified for broadcasters to control the transmission and the retransmission of their broadcasts. Legal framework for related rights protection in Nigeria. In Nigeria, there has been an enactment of legislation such as the Nigerian Copyright Act, Section 1, Subsection 1 of the Act, lists works eligible for protection to include literary works, music works, artistic works, cinematography, sound recording, and broadcasts. Therefore, broadcast in any form of method is eligible for protection, including cable. Also, there is the existing National Broadcasting Code as amended 2020, which states the National Broadcasting Commission is vested with the responsibility of regulating and controlling broadcasting activities, as well as regulating rights and assignments for those rights in Nigeria. In the case of, in the case of American Broadcasting versus Aero, the U.S. Supreme Court decided against the legitimacy in aerial services on the grounds of copyright infringement. 
And hereby, Hero offered a service that would allow their subscribers to view broadcast television at a minimum $10, $10 a month. A subscriber could watch the broadcast in a cell phone or a computer, even a record, even record for viewing later. The plaintiffs then sued on grounds that the retransmission of over-the-hair broadcast was a violation of the copyrights on television content. They sought, a, they sought an injunction which was denied by the district courts, which made them appeal to the Supreme Court against the decision of the lower courts. It was hereby held in the Supreme Court that herald retransmission amounted to an infringement of copyright. Then there's another case of New um, Delhi Television. Please round up your presentation. Your time is up. So please round up. In New Delhi minutes, Television, HOP versus ICC Development International and others, where the court held that the dissemination of information, information such as match updates is essential from the point of view of public interest and hence the same can be done by other individuals, organizations who do not have exclusive statutory license. Creative in comedy industry, Comed comedians spend their careers making people laugh and crack jokes. The biggest concern for comedians are joke thefts. Although there have been cases of com comics being accused of joke thefts, there are very few cases which have been taken to court as it is a very tricky matter for lawyers. Are jokes not eligible for IP protection? The answer is jokes are eligible for, eligible for copyright protection. Copyright is simply the only and exclusive rights given by lawyers to creators, authors, or originator of works for a fixed period to determine and control its use. Copyright is protected by Copyright Acts in, in Nigeria. In the case of um, Nicholas versus Universal Pictures Corporation, the court held that it is the expression of idea that must be original to the creator to possibly gain legal protection through copyright laws. In conclusion, comedy is a creative work. Fashion brands or broadcasting industry are also creative works. Appropriate precaution must be taken to protect these individual works. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, group three. So group four, please quickly your presentation. This is five to us, so we're expecting you to round up by 520, 521. Group four, please commence your presentation. Is group four ready? Group four, who is presenting for you? Good evening, everyone. I'm going to. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Please share your screen. Okay. Mm. All right. For group four, I don't know. Can we see my screen? We can see your screen and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So for group four, we are presenting on financing for creativities and IP. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get enable editing. <laughs> Can other members of group four help out with sharing these slides? If you are having difficulty sharing this, I'll let other member of your group help you with that. We can't hear you. All right. Hello, Victoria, we can hear you now. Victoria, 
Mm. Please unmute. Unmute yourself. You are muted. We can't hear you. Group four, assist your group member. Please unmute your microphone. Do we have a backup presenter in group four? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you. Can you Thank hear you. me, ma'am? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Yes, I'm the group leader of group four. And I would like to say this. Um, we have a backup presenter, and that's Oyeniyi Oluinka. I just want to call her out. Oyeniyi Oluinka. So, Yeni, please take over the presentation. If she's not ready as a group leader, if you can step in and cover for them, that would be that would be nice. Have less less than six minutes left for your presentation. So, if group group four, if you are not ready in thirty seconds, you may have to skip your presentation for today. Okay, so while you are sorting out amongst yourself, if we have time, we'll come back to your presentation. Um, I think we'll move to our mentors giving us their feedback on the presentations so far, presentation from group one to group three. So we'll be calling on Mr. Michael Dugeri to please give your feedback, your comments on the presentation. Um, from group one to group three. Mr. Michael, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Good evening. Yes, we can hear you. Good evening, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, and let me start by commending the presenters uh, for a work well done. I was impressed with the level of um, preparedness that they appear to have put into the presentations. I thank particularly those that volunteered to speak on behalf of members of their group. Uh, it's always a good thing that, don't feel bad that you're not able to complete your presentation. It's always a good thing that you speak less, that you speak, um, that you are not able to finish your presentation within the time allocated. It shows that you know much more than uh, what you have been able to put down. But on the other hand, in preparing for presentation, you should always ask the organizers to let you know how long you are, you'll be speaking, that way you should, you'll be better able to manage your time, pick out key points from your presentation and just give it to your audience uh, point by point. It's better that way. Having said that, I wanted to point out a few comments on some of the presentations. Please do not take this as criticism, it's feedback. And uh, I also want us to know before I continue that uh, this is not meant to, I wanted to say that we needed more time to talk about the things you said. But again, I realized that even if, even if we spend all day talking about these things, we'll probably still be here and they will still not be able to cover everything because they are really like complex uh, legal issues. So it's good that uh, these are just pointed out, these are just challenges for us to take back, look more into those issues, read more about them so that we can know more on the, the work. So for group one, let me start with uh, what you said on page three of your presentation, which is that works is not defined. Uh, so the, I think the, the copyright ad uses the word work in a generic sense. You know, it's not a legal term as used in that law. So, because there's actually definition of works, which is a definition that speaks to a form that a protected work can be. So I want you to go back and look at it so that you can note that correction. But, Specifically, I wanted to talk about the case of for Allen Oche and um, Najan Brewis, where the judge heard that he was not able to grant the relief that the claimant was asking because his work had not been copyrighted. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting case, which I want us all to go back and look at and to ask ourselves questions like, should the judge have looked beyond the form 
you know, and consider the intention behind what the claimant was trying to say. So for instance, must my work be registered before it's protected under the Copyright Act? These are the questions that the judge they ask. But on the other hand, on the flip side of registration is that, you know, without registration, it's always difficult to prove ownership. So the judge was hammering on locals class, uh, the standing, the, he said that the claimant didn't have the standing on which to institute that action. In other words, he was saying that you have not been able to prove your relationship to this work that you are trying to enforce. But it's good because it's also something that we need to develop our law more around. Because the idea behind saying that copyright must not be registered before it's enforceable, you know, there's a lot of uh, jurisprudence around it, which I think that our judges are yet to fully appreciate. So the approach generally, in most of the cases is to say that once it is not registered, they will be careful in granting protection. I'm not saying that it will not be protected, but they're usually very careful in granting protection, which is why even though the, the law does not say that you must register, you must always make effort to register because it makes it easier for you to prove. In addition to every other thing that you can do with it once it's registered. Then um, dance. I also want us to appreciate the difference. You know, dance is something that is that is not commonly talked about. Uh, so we have to appreciate the difference between dance and choreography. A lot of people take it for granted that, you know, dance is capable of being protected. I think more specifically, especially under our laws, what is specifically protected is choreography. And there's the difference between dance and choreography. You know, choreography talks, talks about, speaks more to a performance. You know, remember what the law is trying to protect is something that you have invested in, something that you have put effort in, as opposed to dance, which is something we commonly do just to enjoy ourselves, to have fun. The law is not about to reward you for having fun. The law is really about rewarding you for the efforts you have made. You know, so in cases where you have invested, you know, a performance is typically something that you know require rehearsals, require a lot of time, efforts in putting together. And when somebody has gone through, a group of persons have gone through that process, you know, the law is there to say that okay, we we'll protect, we we'll grant protection to, uh, to them. Under our law, that is Copyright Act of Nigeria. Uh, choreography is protected under neighboring rights, which means it is not specifically, you know, when you say neighboring or related, it's something that is connected, you know. So what 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 that what the law does is to protect it, to grant it a special level of protection outside its traditional uh, uh, modes of protection under that law. So we do appreciate that difference so that you know it's not just that somebody has made a dance. And then you feel that, okay, the person has acted fast enough, the person would have uh, uh, protected it and therefore the person would have gained from it. The law seeks to draw that distinction so that you don't take away so much fun from the public just by saying that, okay, I did this, I feel I did it first. And you know, it's something that you should be able to say, justify and say that, okay, because I put in this effort, I deserve um, this level of protection. Group three that talks about Group three, I wanted to point out on page um, on page eight of your presentation, you said that design was not in the public domain. You, you, you criticize the position that once the design, you know, is um, in the public domain, even if it is the public domain, you know, it, it deserves some level of protection. I found that uh, that position very strange. I want you to look at this again. And ask yourself really if that is the intention behind the law that regardless of whether or not a design is in public domain, uh, it should still be protected. You know, because there is the issue of originality, there is the issue of authorship. I mean, how do you claim that you are the author of something that uh, is already in the public domain? Then coming down to brokers, brokers is something that I'm personally very interested in because it's something that what, for some reason, you know, speaks to other levels of intellectual property, because whatever you do, you always need a medium within which to push it out to people. You know, that, that is where the, the special protection, that is where the special protection for brokers comes in. You know, now you have the capacity with the internet to reach as many people as possible. So you want to be sure that whatever you are passing through that tunnel, you know, it, 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 it belongs to you, it's not infringed upon, and gets to your targeted audience. And we need to incrementally develop the law around how we can better protect, you know, those public spaces under which we all go to showcase our work, 
and then you know to and, and essentially to sell ourselves, to sell our ideas, to sell our creativity, you know, so that at the end of the day, it's going to be a win-win um, between a lot of people. Again, on that page, point of your presentation, that is group three, I want you to look again at related rights and neighboring rights. You tend to have missed it up, you know, talked about. Appreciate the difference, especially under Nigerian law. I understand that this is an international a session, you know, so laws may be different, but under Nigerian laws, I want you to appreciate the difference between related rights, which we don't have, what we have is neighboring rights, and what that entails. So when you look at it, you appreciate the difference, which I talked earlier about, between dance and the choreography. And then I also want you to look at folklore. I mean, it's something that we talk about not so much around here, but something that is useful nonetheless, because it speaks to our value. Folklore is, you know, the the peculiar things, the peculiar stories that you hear about your village or that you typically hear when you go back to your village, it's typically around how one warrior protected ancestors, you know, those kind of funny stories or superstitions, you know, the law seeks to protect them. And intellectual law protection around traditional knowledge is something that is developing that if you pay more attention to, I'm sure you understand and you will enjoy very much. Uh, I'll stop for here and give my other mentor the opportunity to also talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Meke, for the detailed feedback. Um, I hope the mentees took note of the corrections on your general notes and specifically on the presentations. So moving on to our second mentor, Liz Lenzo, please um, give us your feedback on your presentation and the issues raised generally from group one to Group three. Okay, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so my commentaries will be more on an international approach in terms of what to look out for when you're making such presentations. Um, I'm glad at least um, I have had assistance in terms of identifying what the Nigerian uh, legislation so to say because there I, I cannot really make a comment <laughs> so thank you Michael for that um, and uh, he has also given some very incise, um, you know, insightful points that you should consider um, for me when I interacted with the presentations one of the things that I, I wanted to hear more in the introductions were um, you know, the, the, the kind of rights that are there when it comes to copyright, these exclusive rights that are granted, and then based on the specific um, industries you are tackling, identify what does that right to control derivative works, for example, look like uh, while you're giving those examples? What does the right to distribute look like or, or mean? Um, so I think that was really important. And then something else that we always have to remember as IP lawyers is the issue of um, registration and what it means in general and understanding whether, like, for example, I couldn't tell whether in your country it is a, it is a, um, legislative requirement that you register your copyright for you to assert your rights. Um, so that could have been better uh, you know, illuminated in the presentations, but it was implied based on all of the case laws that you presented. Um, again, you know, when you're making that presentation, especially in light of also other lawyers from other countries being present, uh, you know, that is something that's always important to highlight. Uh, so for example, like us in Kenya, we don't, it's not a must we register copyright, uh, but it's recommended. So even in our act that recently introduced the registration uh, platform uh, or registry, um, it's, it's, it's more of like, it's prudent, but it's not a must sort of approach. Uh, so for us, it doesn't really affect uh, your case in court. At the end of the day, it will be an issue of evidence. Um, again, um, you know, when you're looking at some of the presentations, like, um, the ones who are dealing with film, um, film, music, um, even software, I would have loved to hear more about derivative works. What does that mean? How does that change the scope of IP, the opportunities that it has in terms of even revenue streams? Uh, I imagine or I believe that we are aware that at the end of the day, once you have registered, you have asserted that right um, clearly, which gives you now that opportunity or um, um, yeah, ability to license your work because now you have sort of put a title um, to it that you have. The state has recognized that you have this particular 
still a right and you have actually gone a step ahead to um, assert those rights. Um, so I think derivative works is something that we have to have more conversations about even going forward as, as, as upcoming lawyers. It's really changing the game in terms of these rights around especially copyright industries um, and you know tackling the issue of who owns what at the end of the day. We have seen memes coming up. Some of these memes are, are excerpts from films, audiovisual works that already exist from even paintings and, and someone finds a way to make it have some little motion and create a meme. Um, so those are some of those issues that we really want to be talking about, uh, you know, more. Um, I think was it two years ago, the EU was trying to pass um, a directive around asserting copyright ownership for memes um, and making it an infringement situation when you share a meme on your social media. It was an interesting conversation, um, something worth looking into and just you know, asking yourself, so what if Nigeria or what if Kenya was to adopt this? What does that mean for for users of social media or content? And how can we make memes more accessible? Because true to, true to fact, at the end of the day, when you're looking at the traditional IP system, a meme at the end of the day, most of the time is infringing on other people's intellectual property. So, you know, now looking at the culture we're having right now in the digital space, we're seeing some normalization of some of these things. And if we want access to them, uh, what are some of those things that we could look at in terms of um, changing uh, the accessibility conversation and, and looking at what kind of, you know, um, flexibilities that could be there when it comes to, you know, matters copyright, for example. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. We have very terrible weather right now. It's our winter. <laughs> um then um, another thing that I was hoping to see was more of the relationship between registrations and contracts um, so that it's now brought more to light. Um, it was just kind of glazed upon like the example of Harry Potter. Um, I think the, the group that did that presentation, <coughs> Harry Potter would have been a really good even example to take us through um, your presentation in terms of just identifying how um, IP has been utilized um, in the in the in the Harry Potter series and how it created all this wealth into the billions of US dollars. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. You need a break. Oh, I need yeah. to ask if you need a break. I finished my water. <laughs> Um, yeah, if I go downstairs, my daughter will just start yelling and I'll be detained <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> so I'll I'll stay here. Um, yeah, so the issue of just um, always understanding and reconciling why regist how registrations and contracts and um, economic opportunities uh, work together at the end of the day. It wasn't really clear. It was kind of implied. Um, so even when you're making a presentation, sometimes I think we get lost in just trying to show our legal progress that we forget to sort of just have a guiding presentation. So going forward, I think that's something um, to factor in. And then again, in the all the presentations across board, um, I didn't see a lot of conversations around online exploitation, how that affects um, the rights in the different sectors, how that affects, you know, if it's copyright, if it's trademarks. Um, again, now when you're talking about online exploitation, it's also important to always remember about the importance of terms and conditions and the role that they play, especially when it comes to IP. Um, so I hope like most of us here have read terms and conditions of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, because those are some of the issues you face when you're, when you're advising clients on should they make their work available on the digital space. Um, and some of them have that question. Um, I think also the question of distribution um, could have been tackled uh, uh, well, better in terms of, uh, you, you know, just when linking it with contracts, because distribution um, also is heavily reliant on contracts, because most uh, rights holders don't, you know, sometimes prefer to have third parties uh, distribute on their behalf, or even they have direct relationships with some of these distribution platforms or, or companies. Excuse me, and what does that mean? Um, for them so even you know going forward always have at the back of your mind um, the kind of language that goes into contracts uh, is it an assignment um, is it a license really important because we see a lot of 
um, you know, creatives struggling with these terms. It's half, half the time they're not even sure when they get into a, re, into a business relationship, whether they have assigned their rights uh, in perpetuity or, or they have license that like, they never seem to understand. Um, so that's something that always has to be at the back of the mind um, when we're dealing with, with these issues, especially in the creative space. Um, <clears throat> for music, Michael mentioned, I think, the issue of understanding copyright uh, and neighboring rights. And in Kenya, we use the term related rights, very important. Uh, the Marvin Gaye case is one of those instrumental ones that uh, really um, sort of sh shook the, the music industry in terms of um, the kind of rights an author can assert in a musical works. Um, <clears throat> When it comes to the film presentation, I think uh, as well, just um, uh, illuminating these rights in terms of where does copyright start? Starts from a script, uh, or, a, or or you know a script or a manuscript. Um, then you know that be the derivative works. In some instances, films can even uh, you know they come from okay generally literary works. It could be a script, it could be a poem, it could be some storybook or something, and then you know becomes a script. Um, so that evolution of rights generally is something to always have at the back of your mind when it comes to film production and, and rights in film. Uh, again, which is something that's always important for any lawyer advising a creative so that then they understand. Because most of the time, um, um, a, a production company will come to a writer and say, hey, I want a, a, a script from you or a storyline from you. And then we'll have another team of writers and they'll work on it. Um, so what happens to this original writer? You know, those kind of things are really important to always be aware of and think about in, in that process um, and, and the legal issues that arise from that, the considerations that need to be made, uh, and then, of course, falling into uh, up until distribution and uh, what that means uh, in terms of, of IP, in terms of the transactions. Um, and, and again, like I said, some more general comments so that you start thinking about, um, you know, the general landscape of IP uh, in the creative sector. So again, with distribution, even just the fact that, uh, you know, it, it goes without saying that, you know, in any contractual relationship, it's like a marriage. You have to be prudent and diligent with the partners that you're dealing with, because that's what will ascertain whether you, you want a long term relationship or a short term relationship. Um, so that then, you know, your, your client also does better in terms of uh, their strategy with their intellectual property. Um, and then what other comment did I have? Um, I think also on, on fashion, um, um, that uh, discussion could have been highlighted more in terms of just identifying where this IP is when it comes to fashion and talking more because we brushed through quickly about uh, copyright trademarks and designs. Um, so I think, you know, that could have been illuminated better and, and just highlighting the sort of challenges sometimes that are there when it comes to protection of fashion designs um, today. Uh, but again, also just um, marrying how copyright and trademarks and, and design patents or industrial designs, depending on what term you use in your country, how they complement each other and how sometimes you may end up using one strategy over another because you know you have here you have copyright on the other hand you have industrial design or design patents how why would you choose one over the other and how does that affect the strategy um you know that's something uh, that you want to to think about and look at and look at also in relation to your statutes especially if you have an industrial design provision or design patent provision depending on the terminology used there um how long is the duration of uh, protection? How does that impact or affect how a designer's uh, IP strategy looks like? Because uh, remember, again, fashion is a very fast moving um, situation. And sometimes you really need to protect those rights uh, strongly in the beginning because you know they want to make their money and then move on to the next collection. So some of those things are really important to factor in. Um, the issue of again territoriality uh, across board all these um, industries we talked about with fashion i know as africans we know we have a lot of outsourcing um i think like for kenya we do a lot of outsourcing when it comes to manufacturing most of our our, our designers tend to outsource in china or turkey so the kinds of contracts that they need to have at the back of their mind uh, also remembering that they have to register because IP is territorial. And then, of course, the contracts, the kind of clauses that 
complement intellectual property, you know, matters exclusivity. What do you do with the design files? Um, for example, um, um, the ability to even inspect at the time of destruction of these files. You know, some of these countries, when it comes to manufacturing, they're, they're excellent. When it comes to IP, they're just terrible. So, you know, what kind of um, other strategies could be used by designers to ensure that they protect the intellectual property? Something that we really need to think about more as lawyers and also advise our clients more about it. Um, then we touched on, on the issue of, you know, sharing the designs uh, online before protection. Again, very important. Um, I don't know about what your act says, uh, but I, I, you are, Michael made, made, made a note about it. So again, asking yourself, uh, what impact does, you know, showcasing a design before it's protected, what does it have? What impact does it have on the strength of the IP um, and the protection of that IP? Um, with broadcasts, I think the one thing I would say um, is that we need to be aware that broadcasts to be protected, they must have to, they must be broadcasted to begin with. And then, of course, we have those transmission rights um, and then um, the evolution of the digital space and how it affects uh, the broadcasting industry or how it has sort of broadened their revenue streams and the kind of rights that they have. Um, of course, this now leads to uh, now even um, identifying other acts of infringement, for example, circumventing, uh, you know, a broadcaster has content online and you're supposed to, there's a paywall and someone else sort of, you know, finds a way to bypass it, you know, that's circumventing, it's infringement. Um, so, you know, conversations around that, I don't know if it happens a lot in Nigeria, but in Kenya, it's like the norm from, you know, uh, especially with like online newspapers, that's that's been a thing and magazines. We have very brilliant <laughs> pirates in Kenya. Um, with comedy, uh, I'd make uh, a note again to just say contracts as well become a very important conversation to have. Uh, please read the Dave Chappelle story and his experience. Um, and he, he laughed at himself on one of his uh, sitcoms. He did something on YouTube. I'll find the link and share it with, the, with you guys. And he just made fun about his legal situation because he didn't have lawyers at the beginning. And then he realizes, uh, apart from the fact that his jokes had copyright, that, you know, the contract really affected um, the kind of rights he could assert um, over his work and how it affected his ability to even reproduce some of these jokes um, is, is something uh, we want to sort of tackle at the end of the day. Um, and then finally, as we, as we are having these conversations around IP in the creative sector or IP in general, traditional knowledge and cultural expressions is this new emerging area uh, that I think for us Africans, we really took for granted for a long time because for us, we're like, it's our culture, uh, we can use it. But now enter TK and TCEs as an area of uh, a sui generis right um, that's asserting um rights to communities. Uh, I know like, for example, you guys in Nigeria have so many communities and most of you, are, you, know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, ask yourself from community X, if I use this work, what does that mean uh, from this other community? Myself as a member of my community, what does that mean when I use some TK or TCEs from my community? Um, I don't think you guys have an act yet for TK and TCEs, um, but if you're in the process of doing that, you know, maybe you can learn a bit from us. We have an act. Uh, we are having a very difficult time um, affecting it, but we are aware there are rights. The question is, how do we even start paying? Who are we paying? Um, so you, even now in terms of, of the communities, because most of them sort of, um, should I say not really disintegrated, but they, there's a lot of intermarriages. So some of these tribes and communities are like five people and some of them are all over the country. So we are, we are being told now there's this community you pay, where are we paying them? How are they organized? Those are some of the issues we are struggling with right now. So it's crippling innovation for us. Um, but at the same time, we appreciate that that's our right. Um, so hopefully you guys will have a, a better uh, experience. We are now trying to fine tune our regulations to make them more practical and ensure that um, especially the Kenyans are not affected. I think when we were passing, for us when we were passing this act, in our minds we were fighting the Louis Vuittons <laughs> and, and all these big brands and then we forgot that at the end of the day legislation is, uh, it has teeth locally, it doesn't have teeth, you know, outside its uh, territory uh, and in, in the absence of an international instrument around TK and TCEs right now, you know, we are we're sort of wobbling. We are walking in uncharted waters. Uh, but all in all, you guys did an amazing presentation. It was nice to see that 
um, you identified some of the issues uh, that are really important when you talk to when you talk when we're talking about IP and the creative sector. Um, you are at least current in terms of your research and looking at what is happening um, online and, and some of the cases that are happening globally. They really um, affect um, you know how we approach IP even as Africans. We really like it's a whole ecosystem at the end of the day. So uh, when we're doing business, we're not just doing business in our countries. We are trying to do business with other countries, with the whole global system. So it really matters at the end of the day that we are aware of what is happening and uh, we have more practical approaches. And then lastly, I'll make a comment that um, as young lawyers, case law is a very important way or best way to learn um, some of the um, tricks when you're, when you're advising a client. When you read the judgments, um, you know, those obiter dictum statements, uh, you find that sometimes judges will give us um, cheat sheets and just say, you know, if so-and-so had done X, then maybe they would have gotten, uh, they would have asserted a certain right, they would have gotten some money, or if they had done this, then this right would have been uh, clearly brought out. So always pay attention to those judgments, especially the well done ones. They they give us good insight in terms of even how to um, protect clients and and um, get ahead of any potential challenge. Yeah, so that's, uh, those are my comments. Uh, and thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much for the comments, the clarity, and the advice. Thank you so much. Um, to the mentees, please take note of the feedback from the mentors on the presentation process in general and on specific areas of law that were clarified and explained in detail. Thank you so much to the mentors. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Liz. So um, before we proceed to the next part of this um, session, which is taking the questions that have been asked beforehand, we're going to be doing something. So I would ask all mentees to please turn on your cameras and the mentors also would appreciate if you turn on your, your cameras that you start your videos so we can take pictures of today's session. So what we're going to do is, I hope everyone's video is on. So once we turn on our videos, you take a screenshot from your end, swipe to the part of uh, the screen where you have more persons showing, take a screenshot of yourself. And um, after the presentation, after today's session ends, we'd like you to post a picture, post the screenshot on LinkedIn and um, talk about what you learned, thanking the mentors, also, and thanking the organizers of the program. Tag the mentors if you can, tag Gypsy on your post. So I'll give us a minute to do that. Take screenshot of, take a screenshot of your screen, please. And please do not forget to post. So the screenshots are not to be kept for a memorial. We are to post them. So we're moving on to our questions. I'll be reading out the questions one after the other. And for each question, um, our mentors, you each have two minutes to respond to the question. So we have three questions in total. I'll read them one after the other. Two minutes to respond to each question. So I'll be starting since, I'll be starting with, Liz Lenzo, since you're still here, you're the last mentor to speak. You will start with the first question and then Mr. Michael will come on and answer the same question in two minutes before we proceed. And the first question is this, how does a software developer benefit from his creation in a case where they are hired to develop software for a company or organization? How does a software developer benefit from his creation where he's hired to develop a software for a company or an organization. So please, your comments on the question. Okay. So, um, you know, having being aware of the work for hire doctrine and the fact that the IP in the software will transfer to the commissioning party, um, I think a software developer or the attorneys want to understand 
or do their research in terms of the potential of, of this software that they are developing, it would have, so that then they're able to um, quote um, something substantial that would make you know the rights holder happy or help them sleep at night. Um, because at the end of the day, the IP will transfer to the commissioning party, right? Um, but secondly, um, negotiating for, um, what's it called? maintenance um sort of services being able to be at the back end of of um of uh, this software that you have helped to develop being part of 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 the team for as long as possible will also assure you a long term revenue and it also gives you an in towards um you know sort of having more solutions towards making this software better and then maybe subsequently you'll be able to assert some rights and say okay here could we co-share in ip or whatever uh, so that then now you make more money like it as, as when you're an insider after ha having done a work for hire i think gives you the opportunity to be able to um you know create further and then now in the other you know the other creations or assets that you help create you're able um, to sort of benefit better. So at the end of the day, it will, it will depend on the company that you're working with, the kind of software that you're developing, the potential it has, and those opportunities. So, but like what I do for my clients, I always also negotiate for that service level agreement where they are retained for a couple of years uh, as the maintenance team. And every month they still make some money outside the license, I mean, so outside the work for hire agreement, they have a maintenance, uh, a maintenance contract for as long as they can and they still make some money and they get other clients on the other side. I think again with software, you have to be very aware of um, competition. Cause you see for a work for hire, for example, um, you're like a consultant, right? Um, and, and if you don't pay attention to the non-compete clause, for example, you may find that your client will be locked out from working with competing brands. Uh, at the end of the day, once they just understand that what they have created for client X is what they've created for client X, really important, uh, help them understand that if they used anything from the previous work, then they'd be infringing on the IP that they originally created for another party. Um, sort of, so then at the end of the day, they also don't lock themselves out from uh, develop, developing other products uh, outside. So again, also just uh, identifying what is confidentiality, uh, what is potentially infringing what are some of these trade secrets that they need to be aware of when they were working with another company vis-a-vis -vis working with the next company really important um issues to to tackle and and to identify so that then your software developer client or their company is you know protected and they're lucrative at the same time and everyone's and people want to work with them <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Michael, please, your answer to the same question. How does a software developer benefit from his creation when it's a work done for hire? Thank, thank you very much. I think Lisa said uh, uh, most of what I would, have, uh, I would have said. Just to add also that in, in situations of this nature, it's not in every case that maybe you're hired for just a particular period of time. There are instances where your engagement is permanent, so you are more like a staff. So in situations like that, it's a lot um, more difficult to navigate your way around how you negotiate your pay. But other than that, of course, if you're just coming in as an independent contractor for a specific project, it's easier. You have to, you have to weigh your options and then have an estimation of the value of what is it that you are, you are, you are, you are being hired to do so that you can uh, price competitively. And then they, they, there's a matter I handled recently where a, a developer refused to hand over the source code. You know, after, after working on a project, uh, he went away with it. And then we had to threaten and sue before he was able to release the source, source code. So like the, the computer language, you know, with, and that it's like an idea that you have reduced into a language that any other tech person can carry and implement. And if you go away with that, of course, that typically they do that in cases where they want you to keep going back to them for maintenance. Like Liz mentioned, you know, it's like a leverage, you know, and also going away with it also means that it's easy to take it and then give it to another person. It's easier that way. So ideally, like she did mention, the, the contracting around it is very important. It's something that you typically expect 
like in this particular case, there was even no contract at all. So it was particularly difficult. At some point, we were literally begging. But so the contracting around it is very important from the onset. It's something that you typically want to engage your lawyer from the onset, both parties, you know, so that they pay attention to the technicalities around this tech, uh, these tech issues, so that, you know, not just to look at the legal side, look at the practical aspect of it, what is capable of being uh, done. So we talk about confidentiality, you know, uh, and software is something that is, and there's something called fungibility, the ability to break something up in smaller parts and then use them for different, you know, for different uh, occasions or different programs or different projects. And software is capable of doing that. You know, it's possible to take a particular software and use it for another project with very little or even no minor, with very minor modifications. So when you are contracting, when you when you are typically being contracted to work on projects, you know, it's important that contracts address issues such as those. If it's possible that okay, you want to maintain the leverage, you want to go away with the source code, or even going hard higher, you want to go away with something known as object code which is even more difficult to modify. You know, it has to be specified in the contracts and documents so that it's clear to both parties. But ultimately you have to determine, you have to weigh your options as you the developer and know what is it that you are contracting for, especially if you're an independent contractor. But if you're a regular staff working for maybe a tech company or a FinTech or any company at all, it's much more difficult. And then you are typically, the restrictions around what you can do uh, is usually tighter. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the feedback, Mr. Michael. As someone who is very interested in IP protection for software, I would really love more details about the case that you mentioned. So maybe I'll contact you after this session. So thank you very much for that. Then um, moving on to the second question. Mr. Michael, please, you take that first. And the question is this. How does IPRO intellectual property rights, how does intellectual property rights protection come into play? Bearing in mind the principle of copyright law that the person who creates the work owns the copyright in it. So how does IPRO protection comes into play? Bearing in mind the principle that the person who creates the work owns the copyright in it. So Mr. Michael, please. So under Nigerian law, the position is that the, the, the author of that work is the owner of that uh, copyright, of the copyright in it. Hello. But the law, so the law also makes uh, exceptions in cases where okay. you, know, you are hired to do that particular work. And I think this is related to what we just answered. So it will depend on, it depends on the circumstances under which you made that, uh, you carried out that, that endeavor. So if it's under a situation where you are hired, and so section 10 of the Copyright Act of Nigeria, for instance, says that in cases, the primary owner of a copyright work is the author of that work. But in cases where the person, the person does that work in the course of employment, or in the course of an engagement for independent contractors, you know, there should be an agreement between the employer and the employee or the contractor that uh, the, 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 the copyright in the work that is being created will belong to the employer. In the absence of that agreement, you know, it is assumed that that copyright remains with the author, that is with the employee, notwithstanding that they have been paid for that particular endeavor. What that means is that it's important under Nigerian law, uh, I don't know this, the law in Kenya, but under Nigerian law, it's important that there should be an, an agreement. In fact, some, some people have gone as far as saying that it's not just enough to have a, an employment contract in which you just pick out a clause or a section that talks about ownership of intellectual property. You know, some people are going to have to say that in addition to your regular employment contract, there should be a separate document that says that, you know, whatever intellectual property you create in the course of this employment belongs to your employer, even though that is more academic. In practice, what you typically have is your employment contract will specify that, specify whether or not intellectual property created in the course of employment belongs to you or belongs to your employer. And in most cases, it belongs to your employer. So, but in the absence of that agreement, the absence of anything in your contracts that specifies that, it means you will retain the intellectual property in any work that you create 
in the course of your employment. Thank you very much, Zameka. So Ms. Liz, please, your response to the same question. Ownership I just, of yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael has answered it perfectly. What I'll just say is that at the end of the day, there must be a contract if you're going to uh, own the work. If you're, if you're commissioning work, it must be in writing. There must be something written. Otherwise, the default position of the law, I think in most jurisdictions, is that the rights are with the mm -hmm. author. So at the end of the day, it's about being smart and analyzing what is your situation, what do you want to get out of it, uh, and, and identifying that. And then one thing also to add is that um, when we're talking about uh, commissioning works um, and or being hired at the end of the day, again, um, for example, with copyright, we have the moral rights. Um, in Kenya, under our act, moral rights cannot be transferred. So which means as much as, say, Michael hires me to create a software for him, somewhere in his marketing material or whatever it is that he uses, they will be there. A software by Liz Lenjo or my company name or whatever, so that then that right of attribution still um, exists. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you guys, but that's something that also you want to have at the back of your mind. Um, you know, you don't take it away just because. If you can also don't take it away just because at the end of the day also to make the creative system work, I think as lawyers, we have to be fair. So, you know, also give that right to portfolio rights to whoever you have commissioned so that they can get more work, right? Because you probably just commission them from one, for one project and they move on to the next client. Um, so things like that also become really important so that the ecosystem also, um, you know, can grow and give back because, you know, the more creatives are creating and we have ethical practices, the more work we have as lawyers as well. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Uh, thank you for mentioning the position of my rights. I just wanted to add that that is also the position of the Nigerian law. Thank yeah. you for bringing it up. It's important yes. to encourage individual, you know, at the individual level, regardless of the context on which the work was created. You know, your name is always attached to it. And it's something that if you like and call bragging rights, you can always carry it with you and as to your value as a creative. Thank you very much for bringing it up. That's also the position under the grand law. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Michael, for clarifying that position in Nigeria. So I'm uh, moving on to the Third and the final question. Um, Mr. Michael, please you go first on this question. And I read, can we get references as to a person that lost or gained revenue from protecting their intellectual property or not? So this is from this is more from a personal standpoint, from experience. Do you have references of someone who has gained or lost for protecting their IP or otherwise? Yes, I, I think this is something that every IP lawyer can relate to, since this is what you basically do. So at every point, you have somebody either seeking to gain or somebody about to lose as a result of protection or non-protection of intellectual property. But I'll mention, I'll give a short story about a recent experience that I had. I have a friend who wanted to go into fashion, but he has no experience in that regard. But he's experienced in, in graphics designing. So what did he do? He started churning out images, nice images of, of, of fashion, you know. He, he, he created, he, he, he came up with a name, created a concept around what he thought was going to be his brand, you know, and started churning out nice images of, of what, you know, we all thought was his work. And, you know, we kept posting those things. I, I mostly ignored them, but, you know, it was, it was difficult to ignore because they were really nice. And so he came to me one day and told me that he wanted to sue one of the big companies in Nigeria, multinational. And I said, what happened? He said that they took his work and they used it for one of their promotions without his knowledge. That's, that was very interesting. I said, what happened? And he told me that they contacted him to participate in a fashion show that they were about to organize. This was now, I don't want to mention their name, but they are not into fashion at all, but they wanted to host an event, promote an event about fashion. And so they contacted it to, to an event or a management consultant. And the guy went around looking for fashion designers with a name, you know, to include in the program. And he contacted this guy and he refused to participate because the truth of the matter is I had nothing to show. You know, it was more like a paper company that he had. Everything was on his laptop. So he declined and made it look like he was not prepared. He had meetings, no sort of reasons. And 
But unknown to him, this guy that contacted him had gone ahead to harvest his, his pictures online, use his name, and included it in a video. And when he declined to participate, this guy forgot to go back and delete or edit his promotional videos. So he went ahead and, you know, just unveiled it. So at the, at the event, because he was following, my friend was following the event, even though he didn't participate, he was interested in it since it's something that he wanted to go into. He was surprised to see that his name was there, you know, his pictures were there. He was featured as one of the leading fashion uh, designers in Nigeria. And as flattering as that was, it was also shocking to him. And he said, no, 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 I didn't do this. He wanted to sue, he started threatening. And you know, the interesting thing that happened, the interesting thing for me in this whole matter is, I realized at that very point that this guy had gone ahead long before now to do a trademark of his name and his brand and his concept. I was shocked to hear that because I didn't know about that. And I didn't imagine that you have the sense to do that. And armed with this registration, you know, he, when he went to this multinational, those guys, at the end of the day, to cut a long story short, they were surprised, they apologized, they started by saying they will not pay, that they will, you know, all, all the usual talk. At the end of the day, they decided to say to him and they gave him a really nice sum of money, which for him was a lot of money. You know, he was talking, at the, I, I remember that I attended the meeting, at the meeting he was talking about his, uh, his, uh, his partners, potential investors, and you know, when somebody is telling a lie that is so, so convincing at some point, we are like, is this guy for real? You know, there was nothing like potential investors. There was nothing, it was just in his laptop, what he sat and he was, he was playing with. And he ended up bringing him money because the multinational didn't want themselves, like uh, their name in, in the public about some carelessness on the part of somebody they hired. So they decided to pay him off. So, they, what, so what is the takeaway for me? You know, creativity is something that, what the law envisages is that you are putting a lot of effort, you have invested, and the law is therefore interested in rewarding you. But it's also possible that you can come up with something with very little or no effort at all. But the important thing is that once you are able to package it, once you are able to put it in a form that is capable of being identified and being associated with you, you can make money off it. The other takeaway for me, I mean, the side of the multinational is you have to be very careful. You know, there are so many instances where you don't always have control over what you did that resulted in infringement. You have to be very careful. You know, the world has, there's so much awareness now about intellectual property and everybody is being careful. Don't just have these pictures on the internet and use, you know, you can land yourself into big trouble. So yeah, see, there are a lot of experiences like that, but this stood out for me and I just felt that I should share it with you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that, Mr. Make. An interesting scenario. So, Mrs. Liz, have a similar or the opposite side of it to share with us. I'll give one on the opposite side that also tackles something that uh, we didn't get opportunity to to touch on. Um, and this was um, a client who came to us a few years ago. They're in film. Um, they went to a broadcaster and um, pitched a script that they had been working on. Um, uh, so they were very informal with this relationship. So first things first, they it was not a fully de de uh, developed um, storyline. Um, so they did not register anything, but at least even in the list, they could have had like the synopsis registered, the characters, like they could have done something. So, but no, they go to the broadcaster and they think they're really smart and they're giving this amazing, uh, program, uh, with at least a draft of, of the flow of the program and whatnot. I'm with nothing. And then a few months later, they see a trailer going, uh, doing the rounds on, on TV, on YouTube, like a teaser, and they're like, what the hell is going on? Uh, we went and did a, a presentation. So when they came to us, um, so we asked them, do you have any registrations you pursued? Nothing. Do you have any emails? Um, even just registering that you guys went to meet these people? No, we were having online. We were just having telephone conversations. It was terrible. And upon assessing um the the nature of the program, it was like a, a game show. And And if you all are aware, we, when it comes to copyright, for copyright to be granted to any works, it has to be sufficiently developed. And that's one of the challenges that, of course, in the film industry that is there. If your idea is not sufficiently uh, uh, developed, then, you know, it's a concept. Copyright is not granted to concepts. 
So of course, in that regard, um, they lost out. They didn't even have an undisclosure agreement, which at least also complements um, copyright, especially in industries where you're trying to pitch and collaborate. At the end of the day, if you're dealing with um, you know, people skilled in a certain area of or, or or industry, and you're sort of in a space with people who also know what you're doing, and they can easily reverse engineer. And yet, you've done all the legwork, all the research. You've identified how it even revolutionizes their business model. Um, if you don't have an NDA at the end of the day, you're on the losing end of the stick. So, in this regard, they unfortunately lost. Um, uh, you know, they couldn't pursue anything, and they tried even going to court. It was handled by another lawyer, and they lost. Uh, because they, they did not have any evidence. Um, so I think it's always important at the end of the day that, you know, that, that registration happens, whether it is a must or not in the different countries that your clients might be at, it's really important. Um, Non-disclosure agreements, especially for, you know, where there's commissioning works or some collaborations being anticipated, uh, always important, those NDAs. And, and you know, unfortunately, uh, as 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 you get into the profession as young lawyers, you will you will interact with with lawyers who with with clients who be like no 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 I went online and I downloaded a template. <laughs> Always discourage, discourage them highly. I've seen an NDA that was being brought to my table and it was under Venezuelan law. I'm like, dude, this is Kenya. What do you mean Venezuela? You didn't read the fine print? Like it was crazy. Um, so it was just funny to watch and and you know as as you do this always just. Uh, encourage people to use lawyers because you know it's a jungle out there and most of them don't know some of them feel like they know it all because they're like oh I'll go online and I'll read about copyright what's so complicated please remind them how complicated it is remind them how just this presentation took you so long to prepare and to identify legal issues um, out of it uh, yeah so that was one of those interesting um, cases I dealt with there are many we could talk about some of these cases for years on end um, I mentioned another one for, for fashion. Um, this particular client uh, or person, I thought that they owned uh, a design to the shorts, even the print. We found out the print was sourced from China. And we're like, dude, you need to understand what is protectable and what is not. Um, so again, some people imagine that when they read online, they know everything and they can self-lawyer. Um, so I think occasionally share that meme about do not confuse uh, my degree with Google. <laughs> There's usually a mug I like to use occasionally when clients try to be clever with me. Um, so have that meme on the side. But yeah, at the end of the day, registration really helps the NDAs and the communications. Uh, whenever there's some sort of exchange leading towards a potential collaboration, those things can really um, save a client's life and, and you know put some money in their pockets. Thank you very much, Ziz, for okay sharing more than one senior with us. So there we have it. Uh, the main things we've heard from both sides for the, those who benefited from protection and those who suffered because they did not protect their intellectual property. So it's beyond the books, it's beyond the theory, it is practical. Um, there are benefits that um, come with IP protection and there are consequences where protection is ignored. And we take note of all that the mentors have said, take note of the use of NDAs where protection, where registration is lacking. The NDAs can serve as protection temporarily. Thank you so much for those scenarios. Thank you for the answers to all the questions. So I'd like to call on Ms. Juliana to give her two cents on the questions, the presentation in general, and of course, offer her vote of thanks as we conclude on today's session of the mentorship program. So over to Ms. Juliana. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for moderating. Thank you, I always enjoy when you moderate, it's so professional and interesting and you look good, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank um, you, Ma. And to our I really want to say a very big thank you to them. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for coming. Today has been amazing. We have learned a lot. Personally, I have learned a lot. And even from the presentations from the mentees, thank you for cooperating with one another. Thank you for putting your heads together, researching, presenting, and to even think about the fact that you had to make such um, deep presentation within eight minutes. 
you really did very well. And I want to say that I'm very proud of you. And for group four that was not able to present, please try to ensure that this, not, this does not repeat itself again. On the back end, I want to thank Hussein for helping with the back end of the work. And um, hopefully we'll be seeing ourselves again next week, Friday. And to everyone who put their videos on, I can see your lovely faces. And I think that's one of the amazing things because when we see your faces, there's some people that have met me on the road or at events and they're like, oh my God, I'm this, I'm this. And for some, I recognize them because I see them, like I see their faces. While for some, I don't recognize them because they always put their cameras off. But I want to say a very big thank you to everyone who has um researched presented put your video on and everything you are amazing people thank you so much um so i wish everyone an amazing weekend have a lovely time and to our mentors thank you is not enough to say how great Hello, I think we lost Mrs. Juliana. Um, please, can anyone else hear me just to be sure it's not from my end? Yes, yes here you can. can. Okay, so it's, it's from her end. So she's having her some. Network is fluctuating. Yes, her network is fluctuating. So I wrap it up for her. Thank you for today. Okay, she's back. She's back. Let's see. Ms. Uh, Juliana, sorry. can you continue? Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Okay. Oh, my God. Sorry, my internet. So I was saying thank you, everyone. Have an amazing yeah. weekend. And please take care of yourselves. And thank you to our mentors, Liz and Michael. We are so grateful. And please send our regards to your baby downstairs. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.